Well, good morning again. I'm not sure you're awake yet. Do I hear hello? Okay, thank you. A few over here. We are happy Monday. Thank you. Uh, today, this morning, we have the privilege of hearing from Reverend Dr. Delia Newish Olver, who comes to us like the long direction. She was born in Argentina to a, a Swiss family. She has been all over in the country. She's served um, at uh, Sister Institution of Spring Arbors at Seattle Pacific University. She served the denomination, the Free Methodist Church, uh, in, in places like, uh, in areas like working with urban development, um, in leadership development, and right now she serves as the area director of our Latin ministries and continues to do um, leadership development and church planning uh, in that area. And we got to hear, if you were at church in this building, Yesterday, we got to hear a little bit of what God is doing, how he's building the kingdom through her efforts and through the people she's in relationship with. We're going to hear a little bit more about that today. So, Delia, if you wouldn't mind coming to stand here, we're going to pray over you. So, if the rest of you would stand, and if you, a few of you would come and lay hands on Delia, we'll pray for this morning, pray for our time together, pray that the Spirit of God would work through her to challenge us in our own kingdom building efforts. So church, would you lift your voices in prayer together? Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful to have an opportunity to gather together here today. On this Monday, as we set our minds toward learning, as we set our hearts toward hearing from you, as we set our lives toward pursuing your truth in all matters, we ask that, uh, that Delia would be your spokesperson today. As we receive of your word through her, would we also receive you into our lives. Spirit, would you move and soften our hearts as we worship today, as we lift our voices, as we lift our prayers to you. Would you hear, would you hear our, our, our hearts that we might hear from yours? Thank you for meeting us here. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. So as you heard, I work in Latin America, and so I'm freezing this morning, but it's great to be here. Now this idea of a Christian college, a Christian university, this does not happen in Latin America. And today, there are people in Latin America praying for me because I'm here, and they know I'm going to be speaking in chapel today. But by extension, they are praying for you as well. And I'm wondering if you would let me take a picture of you that I would like to put in Facebook so that people see the faces of the folks they've been praying for. Is that okay? So if you don't want to be in Facebook, in my Facebook, you just hide, because this is it, folks. Let's do it. Uh, you have to smile for a long while. I take several of them, because the light is funny here. Whoa. They won't believe this. So the concept of gathering in a Christian college to study like this is unbelievable for folks in Latin America. So thank you for letting me take the picture. And thank you for being here. Is, is chapel compulsory? Well, thank you for being here anyway. <laughs> so when Chapel Brian introduced me, he, um, he, he did a very nice introduction, and, and I like it. Actually, I, I told him to say that. Um, he asked me what, you know, what, what should I say when I introduce you? But, but I did it on purpose because he was introducing me to a North American audience. And if we were in many other countries, certainly in any of the 11 countries in Latin America where I work, no one would ever start introducing me by saying who I am. It's always about where you come from. It's always about who are your parents and who are your grandparents and how did you get here. So I want to tell you a, a little bit about my, grandpa my grandfather. I used to be fascinated 
by, by hearing the story of how he came to faith in Jesus. He was the first believer in his family. And the way it happened was that he was still in college when he was sent to the city to finish up a, um, a business deal that uh, his family had been involved in for quite a few years. And he just had to show up at an office, had to sign up some things on behalf of the family, and then take a train to go back to the town where they lived. And um, the, the business deal was done faster than he expected. And on the way to the train station, in front of the train station in Switzerland, there was this park, and in that park, there was a group of college students that were playing worship music. They were playing their guitars, and they were singing. And my grandfather was just attracted by the music and listened, and then one of the students gave a very brief, what I would call a testimony. It was like, this is my life before Jesus, this happened when I met Jesus, and this has happened since I met Jesus. It couldn't have been longer than four minutes, the way he would talk about it. But it made such an impact in my grandfather that, that he just stood there. He was just glued to these people doing their Christian music. And then an, an older person, later he found out he was a pastor, said, if you would like to hear more about what this guy just talked about and the music we have sung, just hang out, we're gonna be hanging out and come and talk to us. And my grandfather went to talk to this guy and this guy led him to Jesus and that changed the story of my family for generations past and I can tell you for generations future as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah for college students who go out there and play their music and give their, tell, tell people what Jesus is doing in their lives. And so um, he was, as I said, he was the first fa Christian in his family, and his family was horrified by what this guy had done, and they kicked him out. And he tried to reconcile with them, but it didn't happen, and so he went to the farthest point in the globe that he could think of to serve Jesus. And he went to Argentina, and that's why I have a Spanish accent, because of that. So he gets in Argentina, and he was a single guy from, uh, uh, from Germ uh, Swiss, German-speaking, the German-speaking part of Switzerland. So you will know from geography lessons that in Switzerland there are four official languages. And my grandfather was monolingual, he spoke only German. When he got to, Su to Argentina, he was feeling very lonely, and he met another missionary from Switzerland who spoke only uh, French, and she was pretty. And they got married. And then they learned Spanish to talk to each other. And that's why they had eight children. It took them a while to learn Spanish to talk to each other. <laughs> that's the way they will tell us the story. Yeah. <clears throat> but here is another part of the story. They had eight kids, right? Seven of them became um, business leaders, leaders in their spheres of influence, pastors and missionaries. And one of them, and missionaries and, and people who had influence uh, around the world, really. And, but one of them was an attorney. He was also a leader in the field. He was full of fun and music and life. And, and he was a scoundrel. And he got very creative with the law and he ended up in jail, and he died in jail. He met Jesus just before he died. And I grew up in, in a family like that, a family that, um, that stayed in touch a lot, even before all the social media things that we have today. And at family gatherings, I used to hear stories of families that have moved to another city to, to lead people to Jesus or to, to find the people that God had already prepared to hear the story of Jesus. And at family gatherings, as a kid growing up, teenager, young adult, I used to hear of, of um, stories of what God was doing and what our part as a family was with that story. And then all of us, I was a kid, and we would all get together and say, well, you know, Johnny from church would be great in going there because he has the gift of whatever to, to bring that community of faith into maturity. And 
these were conversations that I had with my parents and my grandparents as I was growing up. I grew up in Argentina during a time of revolutions. You here get snow days. I used to get revolution days. If there was a revolution, school was closed. And you know, it was the equivalent. And uh, now I realize how serious it was. I mean, people were dying. And I was, yes, there is a revolution. I'm not going to school today. <laughs> But I do remember what happened during those days of revolution because it wasn't ever just one day, it was like two or three days, and, and people were getting killed. I was just, you know, what did I know? And, and, but I do remember at mealtime, my family praying, we wonder how the people that we sent to start a church in that town are doing because of the revolution. And I'm wondering how we will connect with them to make sure that the new believers are doing all right. And then we, I was a kid, what did I know? We would talk about how we could be part of the solution of bringing wholeness and bringing goodness to those folks that we had sent to lead others to Jesus. So that was the context in which I grew up. And clearly, it, it was different. And, and it took me years to realize that what my family was doing, I didn't have the language then, and I, and I never heard them use this language, but my family had chosen to live on mission for God. And, um, and they never used that language about themselves, but I can tell you that I grew up watching from the inside what happens when a family, when a people a, a, a gathering like that, when people choose to think, how can I enter into the mission that God has for us as individuals and us as a family? And you better believe that it shaped me, and I wouldn't be here today if, I had, if that had not happened. I moved away from all of that. I moved to Europe. I lived in England, and then I lived in Switzerland, and I did things that I'm not proud of. I rejected my Christian heritage. But, you know, during the time, I could see now, looking back, how, how God had, he was caring for me, even when I didn't feel that God was caring for me. And there was one time when I was in, in Switzerland, and I was feeling pretty alone, and I was feeling disconnected from life and from people, and, and life was hard, and I, I was feeling alone. And I started to read the Bible, and um, you know, I wasn't a particularly good Christian, but I started to read the Bible, and I, and I got to Jeremiah 1, 4 through 10. And I don't know if it has ever happened to you, but, but as I was reading that, and I tell you how it happened, it was like, mini, 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 mini. Here it is. I'm going to read this. And do you know what it was? It gives me the chills even today when I tell you the word of the Lord. This is what it says in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, 4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. You must go wherever I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. And today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Has it ever happened to you that you open the Bible and it's like you know that you know that you know that you know that God is speaking to you through that. And that happened to me that day. And I knew that God was calling me to something way beyond myself. And with a great deal of trepidation, I said yes to God. I had educational plans that had to be adjusted. I had relationships that had to be renegotiated. But as I look back on my life, I am astonished at what God does when we agree to live with the priority of his mission in our lives. From little things to huge things. The idea of speaking in front of people used to freak me out. 
Not anymore. Now they have to tell me when five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, you're running out of time. From little things to big things, I know that when someone like the person that I was is called of God to speak as, as that happened with that Bible verse, that God was going to put words in my mouth. And I, I've come to realize that God doesn't call me to do the things that he doesn't empower me to do. Because that's the way God is. In Jeremiah, the verse said, I have called you to be involved with nations and kingdoms. And, and I look back on my life and I'm just astonished because, you know, it wasn't that I have always been intentionally going back to Jeremiah 1, but I see a pattern in my whole life of how God has put me in places where I have worked with people from other nations and from other kingdoms. Here in the United States, all the churches that I pastored ended up being multicultural churches, and I was in daily contact with people from other nations and other kingdoms. As I reflect on Jeremiah 1, I can see the connection, the fulfillment of God in my life, and what happens when to the best of my ability, I say yes to the priority of the mission of Christ in my life. And actually, it is amazing. It talks here in Jeremiah 1 about building and planting. And you know, my entire life has been about building into people's lives and about church planting, planting and building. But because of the way God called me, I knew that someday I was going to be appointed a prophet to the nations. I didn't know what it meant, I didn't sort it, I didn't know when it would happen, but then when I became the area director for Latin America in, in, with the Free Methodist Church, and when I was invited to oversee the Free Methodist Church in 13 countries at that time, I knew that this was the fulfillment of God's call in my life through Jeremiah. There was a convergence of my gifts, and it was, it was like God was just weaving this thing that was absolutely amazing to me to watch. This is my story. This is my story. I haven't always been conscious of the consistencies of God's call in my life, the overarching plan in my life. I haven't always lived with a sense of destiny. This is not a prideful announcement, but a statement of my calling. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, I was set apart and I was appointed as a prophet to the nations. So what's your story? What, what's your story? I see myself in Jeremiah 1, but obviously that was not written for me. It was, it was spoken to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, a Jewish man, I'm a Swiss Argentinian woman, 219, this was 600 before Christ. There are many similarities here, but there are also many, many differences. And this connects with me in the ways that I have just told you. But, but the word of the Lord applies to every one of you as well. And so I want to say to you today with the authority that the word of God gives to me, that before you were born in your mother's womb, you, God knew you, and God set you apart. Regardless of the circumstances of your birth, you are not on earth by accident. You are not here by accident. You have been chosen by God. And you may say, like I did, I don't know how to speak, or I'm shy, or whatever. But you know, it is part of the Wesleyan perspective of how we people in the Free Methodist Church read the Christian story. We believe that we are all called, that we are all chosen, that we are all set apart for something, and that you were born for that, and that God wants you to know what that is. And you may not know the details long term, but if you keep saying yes to the Lord Jesus Christ in the daily yeses, 
and sometimes in the hourly yeses, you will fulfill the call for which God has called you. From the Old Testament, we understand that from all the peoples on the earth, God chose the Jewish people to bring salvation to the world. And over and over again in the Old Testament, we read that when a people or a person, they were chosen or for something, it wasn't because they were special or because they were perfect or because they had their stuff together. Actually, it is amazing in the Old Testament how messed up people were and then God did his thing in them, and then God used them. All kinds of really ugly things. You think your family is dysfunctional? Read the Old Testament. <laughs> You'll see real dysfunction there. You see, the call of God comes to you, not because of who you are, but because of who God is. Not because you have it all together, not because you've never messed up, not because you come from a perfect family, because no one does, but because the word of the almighty God comes to you and says, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you and I have set you apart and I have a plan for your life that is going to be amazing in God's eyes and in your eyes as well. The verbs here are significant because in this passage, the verbs are not about what we do, but they are about what God does. And it's a good reminder that when God calls us, it's about what he does, not in us, through us, in spite of us, in sp not what we do, but what he does. He formed you. He set you apart. He appoints you. He sends you. He says, I am with you. He says, I will rescue you. And over and over again in the Old Testament, we read that when a person or a people were chosen for something, it isn't so that they could proclaim, this is what I have done, but so that they could bless others, chosen in order to bless others. And the New Testament makes it clear that the followers of Jesus Christ are the new Israel. And all the promises and all the commissions that were given in the Old Testament to the Jewish people are given to us today, followers of Jesus Christ. We get to do this. We get to receive the blessing from God and to bless others. And it's striking in the New Testament how often when the idea of blessing others is used, witnessing to others, sharing with others, the language used more often than not has, not, has to do with the nations, with the peoples, with going to the ends of the earth. Throughout all of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, there is a theme of all of God's people. That is you, and thank God, that is me, being called to go to the nations to be a blessing to others. In the New Testament, has different language. It says that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses. You will not be able to avoid it. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's not a multiple choice question. Do I choose here? Do I choose there? Do I choose the ends of the earth? No, it's all of it. It's all of the above and it's all the time. So what will your story be? What will your story be? You, you're writing your story. And you're writing a story that will shape, shape generations. Perhaps you don't see it now. But before you were born in your mother's womb, formed in your mother's womb, God had ideas for you that are beautiful in his eyes and that will create in you such a sense of I was born for this. And God does not want to keep that a secret from you. 
And until he clarifies what that all is, he wants you to keep saying yes every step of the way, writing your story a page at a time, a day at a time. Perhaps you say, Pastor Delia, I am not what I should be in my spiritual journey, even to be considered for God's great plans. And I said to you, a great catalyst for your spiritual life is realizing that the great God of the universe is calling you and has a job for you to do and would love for you to do it and that you were born for that. So I've told you my story. If my uncle had not died already, he would kill me for having told you the part of his story that he died in jail. What will your story be? I've told you mine with a lot of details. What will your story be? What will the story of your family be? What will the story of your dorm be? What will your part be in this generational story that God wants to write in you, through you? He does not want to keep it a secret from you. He wants to tell you, but he wants a yes from you daily, and he will blow you out of the water with what he does in you as you continue to say yes to him. Let's pray. God, it seems audacious to stand here and to say that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, that the Almighty knows each one of us by name and calls us to participate with you in the great story that you are writing for the world and that you want to use us, us, to bring our story under the lordship of your story and then watch amazing things happen. But here we are, Lord, and we want to say yes to you. An individual yes, and a corporate yes. Will you take our yeses and guide our steps? Will you take our relationships, our loves, our studies, our concerns, our tensions, our joys? Will you take all of this that we bring to you and will you energize it by your spirit and use it in a way that will change the world in which you place us? We say yes to you, yes, yes. Help us, Jesus, to write our stories according to your script for us. May your story overwhelm ours. And when we see the result of that, we will give you honor and glory because you are an amazing God. I will pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for having me. Go in peace. You are dismissed. <laughs>